Our hero, jacked, gone, vanished into thin air. <laughs> My dad must have been his biggest fan. I knew how sad he'd be. Heck, we all were that day. Zanar, I says to myself, what are you thinking? I went running straight back home. We sat up talking about Jack all night. Welcome to uh, Half Glass Gaming, um, and I gotta say that I'm disappointed in all the uh, StarCraft II champions who have been indicted for match fixing. Uh, with that, though, um, I am the moderator. My name is Julian Watkins. I was born in Milwaukee. I am not a Sagittarius. I'm joined, as always, by Just Josh. Just Josh. And the Handy Mandy. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I don't know. She doesn't know, folks, and that's okay. Just don't spill that coffee. I'm also joined, as always, by the classically trained Rev. I was born in Houston, Texas, and I am so Gemini, I changed my birthday so that I'm a Taurus. Wow. I was born in Fargo. Did you ever put anybody in a wood chipper? Nope. You are clearly a disappointment to your hometown. No, it's not actually based on a true story. <laughs> I, I, I know. <laughs> but it's like the more Canadian side of Fargo, right? Right. <laughs> right on the border. It, it's well, Fargo is one of those cities that's like half in the U.S., half in Canada. Yeah, and primarily she, it's Canadian. Yeah, right, and she was born in the Canadian part of Fargo. Yeah, now that we've got all of that established and taken care of, I've heard rumors. Okay, and it's a great album, but I've also been hearing stories that Josh is going to open a restaurant. I'm not necessarily going to open a restaurant, but Mandy and I had this great idea yesterday. Uh, she was telling me about Big Boys Restaurant. Not Bob's. No, just Big Boys. Okay. You don't have Big Boys here, at, like, at all? Here, no, but there was a Bob's Big Boy, I think, in Milwaukee. So, Mandy <laughs> was telling me about Big Boys. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the mascot character is kind of this, like, evil-looking little dude, but he was not intentionally evil-looking. And apparently there was like a comic book about him where he was, you know, just kind of your average Mickey Mouse. Yeah, Mickey Mouse generic character. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, if you're our mascot, you have to be generic. And I was like, well, I think it would be cool to have a comic, like have a restaurant based after a criminal, like, you know, Prison Ted or whatever. <laughs> Prison Ted's Super Sub Shop, and it, we would have comic books where every every episode Prison Ted breaks out of prison and mm -hmm. he's like, "I'm craving those Prison Ted's Super Subs," and so <laughs> he, he breaks out of prison to make subs for people. <laughs> no, he breaks out of prison because he's craving those subs. No, well, that makes sense. And too. it's like you know, like that's advertisement. It's like this guy loves these subs so much that he'll break out of prison for them. I got it. Tastes like that in the big house. <laughs> <laughs> and the order tagline was going to be, tastes better than prison food. <laughs> I always thought Big Boy reminded me of Ortho from Beetlejuice. He, he's creepy looking. I worked at Big Boy's for a while when I was in high school mm -hmm. as a hostess and then a waitress. And like you just have to walk past that statue at one in the morning. It's not a, not a good feeling. Yeah. I like the uh, lard lad take on them in uh, The Simpsons. <laughs> he is quite chubby. Yeah, he's a For a guy who a lifts that many. Uh, what is big boy lifting? I can't even remember. It's a tray. Yeah, for a guy who lifts that many trays. Yeah. He's, he's rather portly. <laughs> it seems like he wouldn't get along with Mario for some reason. Well, they'd be fighting over cut. whether they're going to eat burgers or lasagna. Yeah. Did you serve pasta at Big Boys? You know, <laughs> well, at least they bring, did in bring, like bring, 2001 when I was Bring truth and facts into the situation, and my joke just dies. Yeah, that's a shame. I'm not allowed <laughs> to be funny. But I mean, all, all, all I want to do right now is watch nature documentaries. So I think Josh and I have been <laughs> trying to make our own excitement since <laughs> Josh wants to go out, and I'm like, no, I, I want to learn about narwhals, Josh. But Josh has this thing where he picks on all the animals I like. And he says that they aren't cute. And like he was picking on pandas, and I'm like, Josh, do you know pandas poop 40 times a day? Because I know Christ. once he knows that. <laughs> and then Josh was making fun of that. And then so I've like come back out of like, Josh, I've done more research on this panda poop thing. <laughs> you, know, you know, panda poop is an excellent alternative fuel source, and that 
their unique properties to panda feces because of the extremely limited diet that they eat and that they can convert it to fuel incredibly quickly. So if they can get the panda population up, like panda poop will be fueling our cars. And then he was yeah. like, oh man, pandas are the best. That is <laughs> don't exactly reproduce what he said. Yeah, because yeah, they're pooping problem. all the time. It's true. They're well, eating and pooping. They're probably eating poop at the same time. Yeah, and oh. if they poop like 40 times a day and it can be converted into fuel, once you get enough of them, you just chain them into a car. Right. You know. I mean, they don't care as long as they can eat. Yeah, well, pandas eat idiots. for 13 to 16 hours yeah. a day and well, 40 times assholes. a day. Yeah, that's, that's because their digestive system is not actually set up to digest the thing they eat. Wood. And they <laughs> only want to eat one thing. Yeah. Right. That's so bizarre to me that pandas evolved the way they did. Like, how does a creature evolve in such a way where they are obviously designed to be carnivores, but they refuse to eat meat or any other plant other than bamboo, Mm -hmm. and also evolve in such a way where they don't want to have sex. Even if they did want to have sex, the the female panda is only fertile like two days out of a year or something, and most male pandas don't have a penis long enough to actually impregnate a female panda anyway. Well, because they'd be cute. If they, cuter if they were sexless, because who wants to watch animals boning? Well, apparently me, because all I do is watch nature documentaries. <laughs> I've seen like, in the last couple of days, I've watched chameleons have sex, I've watched lemurs have sex. <laughs> Really, no, no narwhal sex though. But I did learn that narwhal skin is one of the best sources of vitamin C on the planet, and it is what kept Vikings from getting scurvy was Neat. eating the meat of narwhals. I, I've been working really hard to try and sell Josh on narwhals. And I think I narwhals are fantastic. I think narwhals are whales with unicorn horns. How can you no, not well, like that? They're poorly designed. Well, no, they're not. <laughs> Their horns are like super powered. They can detect sound from like miles away. They're one of the most elusive creatures on the planet because nobody can get near them because they're so able to detect sound that, like, they hear a boat and they just all swim away. Respect the beautiful narwhal, you motherfucker! Their, their horns are are basically the opposite of human teeth in that they're really soft on the outside and then hard on the inside. It's where all their nerve endings are, and so their horns are basically super-powered detecting devices, and this is also why you can't keep them in captivity because their horns are so sensitive that it can affect their heart rate, and um, if you can't control the sound in like an aquarium then it can make them get ill or you can have a heart attack and die see that's why i think they're poorly designed if you break off their horn they just die Mm -hmm. they don't they don't just die if you break Mm -hmm. off their horn you bump some low bass and they shit themselves (laughs) no but they're 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 white uh perpetuated the belief in unicorns for so long because people could produce a unicorn horn and sell it and be like here this is a unicorn horn and people be like unicorns are real and be like i see unicorn horns like at the street market all the time man of course they're real talk about asset reuse (laughs) (laughs) they're really cool even though josh doesn't believe me Narwhals are fantastically designed. Pandas are terribly designed, but no, nothing about that. No, they poop 40 times a day, so that's awesome. Well, I think I think pandas are poorly designed as well. Pandas they're just, are terribly designed. They're, they're like, they're cute, and so people have like really forced them to stay in existence. Yeah, right, but narwhals they're, they're, are cute? Yeah. Narwhals so, are adorable, but wait. yeah, no, pandas have hit an evolutionary dead end. <laughs> Vikings are eating narwhals to ward off scurvy. One ounce of narwhal skin contains as much vitamin C as an entire orange. However, they're also an incredibly elusive breed of... Well, consider that this is hundreds of years of evolution. So back then they were just like... And also the narwhal population was presumably much higher. They're Mm. estimated to be about 90,000 narwhals right now, though it's hard to be sure that's accurate because of how good they are at avoiding people. Mm. I don't like it. (laughs) I, I kind of been I've kind of been wanting to watch some Miss 3K break it up a little bit because mm-hmm. Josh and I are going to the Mr. K live show mm-hmm. in Minneapolis, which I'm super excited about. Uh, what, how, what do you call it? M- Mr. K Mystery Mist Science Theater 3K? 3000. See where I'm from, we just call it MST 3K. No, I've I just always call said it Mystery Mist- Science Theater. <laughs> But uh, no, they're doing first time ever mm-hmm. reunion show with full cast, all the hosts, including mm-hmm. the new host, everybody there, a one time live show in Minneapolis, taping it for, you know, DVD Blu-ray special that people will buy. And Josh and I got tickets, it sold cool. out the day the tickets officially went on sale, but I had an early password, so. Nice. We're pretty psyched. It's going to be good times. Hopefully. No, it's definitely going to be good times. How is Live Miss 3K going to be bad? I like that show, but I mean, not every episode's uh, a home run. 
I mean, most of them are. Yeah. But no, I mean, I was kind of obsessed with Mr. K in high school. Oh, same here. I, I used, used to skip to, uh, it to watch it. Yeah. Uh, no, and then I used to... Just skip, I used to skip Mr. K to watch school. That's what I meant. <laughs> People were like, you want to watch MST3K? And I'd be like, Mr. K? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Mystery Science Theater? Oh, yeah. No, I don't want to watch that. I'm going to go watch school. <laughs> no. Just skip that. I used to um, print up mistings, of, which is just doing a Mr. K style riffing of something. Uh, mistings of... Final Fantasy games mm-hmm. and like carry them around because the internet back then when you had a dial up connection I didn't have time to read like a 200 page story so I'd print up this 200 page story <laughs> and then carry it around and read it and I found the cast of Final Fantasy 7 gets kidnapped by Hojo and forced to watch Final Fantasy 6 on a movie screen <laughs> and so they make fun of it and so it was called The Misting of Final Fantasy 6 and mm. so I took like these 500 pages and carried them around with me wow. the time. I mean it was pretty bad but it was relevant to my interests as a 16 year old I, I remember spent a lot on paper and ink yeah I re- what I did they do they never figured out about the ink cartridges never had I, uh, ink I remember the fan fictions like that I um Used to write stuff on fanfiction.net where eventually they just made it a rule that you couldn't publish up uh, MST3K and of other people's fanfictions anymore. Like, it was so prevalent. Yeah. No, I, I used to write a lot of really bad Final Fantasy fan fiction, and it's all been scrubbed from the internet, so don't try to find it. It was <laughs> it was not good, but the most embarrassing thing I can remember from this fan fiction is that I wrote a fan fiction where Locke proposed to Celeste, and then after he proposes to her, he walks away, and then he goes, oh no, I forgot to ask her when! And so he runs back, because <laughs> at that time, I thought you had to immediately set a wedding date when you proposed to somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And so I thought, oh, this is so cute. Like, he forgot to do this important thing because he was so nervous. And I thought it was really romantic, but it really revealed that I knew nothing about marriage. (laughs) But you knew a lot about Final Fantasy. I did. And I would like to hear more about that. I used to write Star Ocean and Resident Evil fan fictions, which have not been scrubbed from the internet. So if you can figure out what my pin name was, you can find them and then laugh at them. (laughs) And with that, I will call break. Um, I would like to thank 2X Wheelie A Double. 2X. I said double Wheelie. Hey, Double Wheelie A. 2X Double A Wheelie. Thanks, Aaron Voltenson. Skittles. Storm Trooper Collection. <laughs> I'd like to thank Skittles. They've been really keeping me together this recording Skittles session. Skittles are the worst. You say that, but you're wrong. Exactly. And uh, I'd also like to say, hey, man. Hey, lady. Hey, granny. Listen, you can find this podcast on retrovolve.com. You can also find articles about games that are considered retro and or classic you can also find us on halfglassgaming.com okay we do most of the work for you it's like you're a panda and we just can't let you die although maybe we should (laughs) i don't know uh you can also find us on itunes stitcher radio uh so anyways when we get back from this break and it's been a long time coming this is the big one the one you've all been asking about mandy's final fantasy fan fiction (laughs) yeah final Mandy C. (laughs) We're going to talk about Final Fantasy when we get back from the break. Stay tuned. All right, we're back. Welcome back from the break. Final Fantasy. This is a game series that has been around since the dawn of time. Manny, walk me through the original Final Fantasy. Back in 1987 Mm -hmm. BC. Right. (laughs) Free Far Cry Primal. (laughs) No, uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi had uh, been at Square for a while, and Mm -hmm. he had been bugging them to make an RPG for ages because he was obsessed with wizardry, and they kept telling him no. By his own reports, he was not very popular at Square (laughs) back then. Okay. And nobody thought an RPG would sell, so they're like, no, mm-hmm. go away, Sakaguchi. Nobody likes you. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then Dragon Quest came out, yeah. and it was this huge, huge hit, and they're like, oh, okay, let's, let's let that 
Sakaguchi guy make his stupid RPG. Yeah. And so uh, they gave him a team of only three people at first, and the other team working on another game had 22 people. So he knew he was not a popular guy. Yeah. And so they started working on the game, which at that point was called Fighting Fantasy. Okay. And uh, they found out there was a series of role-playing books called Fight- Fighting Fantasy. They're like, Sakaguchi, you ruin everything. Yeah. <laughs> Your strike game one, is infringing co- on a copyright. No, strike Rename two. It. Strike one is you being you. But. <laughs> and at that point, you know, mm-hmm. Sakaguchi's like, if this game bombs, I'm, I'm quitting Square and I'm going back to school. Oh, and yeah, that's a big deal in Japan, for the record. That. Nobody changes careers there. Don't worry about quitting. Your ass would be canned. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, things are pretty touch and go at Square, mm-hmm. too. So it could have been feasibly their last game. And mm-hmm. so they changed it to Final Fantasy. It's a, people kind of play it up as this really mournful little story, but you know the truth is they just needed another F word, and they're like <laughs> Final Works. They were just looking for some sort of like alliteration. Yeah, though they really wanted FF, and so I mean Final Word, but it, w- it would have at least been Sakaguchi's last video game, and maybe Square's last video game. Mm-hmm. As they were working on it, you know, people actually saw like, hey, this game looks pretty good. So Sakaguchi actually got a development team, and. Mm. And then near the end, they actually let the other 22 person development team even work on the game. Mm-hmm. So they had a real, a real team behind them. And then it was going to have a, a release of 200,000 copies. And back then, you couldn't really create cartridges quickly enough for a game yep. to get more copies if it was a hit. And so Sakaguchi pushed really, really hard to get 400,000 copies printed. And I think he annoyed Square into doing it, mm-hmm. but it paid off because the game was a massive, massive success. And this was on the Famicom? Yeah, on the Famicom. Now back then, um, was it the same as it was for the NES where you had to basically pre-purchase um, cartridges? Yeah, yeah. So it was a relatively big deal. It, it was a big deal, but it paid off. It sold really well. Mm-hmm. There was really a market for new RPGs <sighs> yeah. at that time. And while Final Fantasy certainly borrowed from Dragon Quest, most other RPGs on the market at that time were just straight up Dragon Quest clones. Mm-hmm. And so that one felt really different. There was, there was a heavy emphasis on creating a character. It had a really cool feel and people really got into it. And so they immediately got to work on a sequel. How Although, for my money, I think Final Fantasy is a pretty cool title. No, I think it, it, it's, it is. it's better than fighting fantasy. Yeah. When I was in uh, when I was in high school, I was on the, the yearbook staff in 1998, and they were, like, trying to isolate, like, the, the most popular things in, like, pop culture mm-hmm. in, in that era, like, 97, 98. And, you know, one of the, the editors was like, oh, you know, what's we should get a video game in here. What's a really popular video game? And I was like, Final Fantasy VII. And she looked at me, and I think she thought it was a porn game. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, no, we're not doing I was like, no, I'm, I'm serious. Like, it's a really popular game right now. And she's like, all right, we'll put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, if only it had been a porn game. It would have been on her. <laughs> I mean, there's arguably a sex scene in Final Fantasy VII. Arguably more mm-hmm. than one sex scene in Final mm-hmm. Fantasy VII. Mm-hmm. So the one you can only see if your points with Tifa are high enough. No. That's true, by the way. It's just implied. It's not... There's no actual yes. boning in Final oh. Fantasy VII. Okay, so, you know, this is a tricky series for some because they kind of get released stateside with different numbers in the titles. So... This original Final Fantasy, did that come initially over to the U.S.? Yeah, Final Fantasy didn't come over here until after Dragon Quest had been localized here and was a success. So it was sort of the same process that nobody wanted to release an RPG before mm-hmm. Dragon Quest. So Final Fantasy came out here in 1990. It came out in 1987 in Japan. Okay. And they started localizing Final Fantasy 2, but it was taking a long time. And then at that point, Final Fantasy 4 was already about to be released. And they're like, we don't want to release a new game on the NES. Mm-hmm. We'd rather do a Super Nintendo. Nintendo game, so they just dropped two, skipped three entirely, and went to work on four. And they also started work on Final Fantasy V, but uh, Ted Woolsey said that the game was too hard for... Uh, Ted Woolsey is the guy who localized Final Fantasy yep. games. Yep. I'm sorry. No, we touched on him in our localization. Yeah, uh, he said that Final Fantasy V was just too difficult for Amer- an American audience. 
Legends. So they changed it to Final Fantasy Extreme, mm-hmm. and we're working on that. And then they kept changing the name, and this mm-hmm. was really annoying if you read a lot of video games magazines back then, because it felt like every month this was being announced as a new game, and it never happened. Mm-hmm. And I it, mean, it did come out, but not until uh, the PlayStation era. Didn't didn't they decide to go with Final Fantasy Mystic Quest instead of Five? I mean, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest was released here, and Five wasn't, but it wasn't but, necessarily I, an instead situation. All right, I, I we'll had heard that, that it was okay. We'll touch on that because okay, so one comes out does all right in the U.S. It's no, it did really well. It does really well. Yeah, okay. I mean, not not like gangbusters, but one was a successful mm-hmm. game for sure. Mm-hmm. So then I imagine the. The, the development of two, at least in Japan, after its initial success of one, maybe blossoms a bit, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, both of them sold really well. I mean, every Final Fantasy game has done well in Japan. Mm-hmm. Even 13. Mm. 13 and has done well here, too, technically. Because technically. <laughs> I guess the way I understand it, mentioning Mystic Quest, is that uh, the numbers just weren't Japanese numbers. So they kind of developed Mystic Quest with the idea of dumbing it down, introducing it to a Western market that- as sort of like training with yeah, that's that's how I remember all the advertisements for mm-hmm. Mystic Quest. You know, this, battles out the window. Right, this this Unrails. introduction to RPGs. And I played Mystic Quest. It was baby's first console RPG, mm-hmm. which is what they were trying for. Mm-hmm. I think it backfired. I, I feel like a lot of people didn't like it, and a lot of people these days complain about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it was all that bad for what it was, but it certainly wasn't very in-depth, and I don't feel a pressing need to play it again. Mm-hmm. Now, so, because they did skip quite a few games. Yeah, 2, 3, and 5. Some of that was uh, partially due to localization issues. Yeah, well, 2 is just more the timing, that they couldn't localize it, and that it would be for a dead console by the time mm-hmm. it was released. So they just scrapped that. Three, it wasn't anything wrong with three. Though I, Final Fantasy three is my least favorite Final Fantasy. Is that Fantasy. on NES or is that on Super Nintendo? That was on NES. NES. Okay. But uh, it wasn't due to any issues with three. It was just that they could start work on four. Fours. And so it made mm-hmm. sense. So they released Final Fantasy four as mm-hmm. Final Fantasy two. And yep. then they skipped five because they thought it was too hard and released Final Fantasy six as Final Fantasy three. Okay. After six slash three is when Mystic Quest came out. When did Mystic Quest come out? Mystic Quest came out in 1992, so before Final Fantasy 3 6. Because that was, for me at least, a meteoric game. <laughs> Mr. Quest? Really? No, no, no. I, no. Final Fantasy 3 6. Okay. Yeah, that was, I, I enjoyed say. Mr. Quest. It had some interesting a, elements. Yeah. I mean, maybe Mystic party. Quest was just mediocre. Yeah. I say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, well, it was really such a bad. It was Final Fantasy USA. No, it's Mystic Quest. It's so, so just a, a Romanji version of uh, Mystic Quest. It was yeah. called Mystic Quest there, too. It was it hot, hot-blooded, tough guy Mystic Quest? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, and USA. then it says, it does say USA, but it's Mystic yeah. Quest. I think they were just emphasizing that it was uh, made with American audiences mm-hmm. in mind. Though, incidentally, that was the first Final fantasy to come out in europe oh yeah that's funny so that it spark a lot of interest in europe <laughs> not, not not really i don't think <laughs> i mean the thing is, it's just it wasn't a game that was going to set anybody's world on fire except mm-hmm. maybe a little kid unless who... it was set on fire due to outrage and, <laughs> and that rioting. wasn't bad it was <laughs> unremarkable <laughs> yeah like you know mm-hmm. i i liked the claw like i liked the idea that it had was the the weapons having out of combat uses mm-hmm. so that 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 was kind of a nice idea. You know, I liked the kind yeah. of rotating partners. Yep. So, like, it, it had some nifty aspects to mm-hmm. it, but it was it was a really mediocre game overall. But- Square is just really perpetually concerned about Final Fantasy being too hard mm-hmm. for American players and not. Uh, Final Fantasy IV, when it was originally released as Final Fantasy II, was also made easier. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I don't even know why, yeah. but... I mean, to be fair, so I difficult. played the regular version, the random encounter rate is way too high. Yeah. I mean, so they weren't necessarily making it worse, <gasps> but I think there were other things they changed, too. I just yeah. noticed when I was replaying it on the PSP that mm-hmm. I, I, the random encounter rate was irritatingly high. See, for me, though, it was like, I'm young, you know, playing games, and Especially when I played Final Fantasy VI, it just had so much in it. It had so much uh, story elements and and opportunities to say 
save players or saving characters, you know, I mean, it was... Yeah, Final Fantasy VI was really the perfect refinement of what had become the development process for Final Fantasy at Square at that time. Mm -hmm. What they do is come up with really baseline character archetypes. So, like, we're going to have a thief, we're going to have a gambler, and then they'd Mm -hmm. get the writing team together and they'd divide up these character archetypes and be like, okay, flesh them out. Create as much backstory as you want, and then these people would go and, like, write whole books about these characters. Uh, Surya Saga, who is one of my favorite video game writers, uh, did the work for Edgar and Sabin, and she actually published a book with okay. Square's permission with a complete backstory for the two of them, in Japan only. Mm-hmm. But uh, because she really, literally wrote an entire book of their backstory. Wow. I, I believe that. Final Fantasy VI, like you mentioned, it being kind of this meteoric game, mm-hmm. and it certainly was for me. Like, I played video games before that, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But uh, VI was really my first RPG, yeah. and it just blew my fucking mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like, I, I really feel it's what started me down the path of storytelling and because like it it gave me the understanding of story of mm-hmm. character emotional weight yeah, right emotion like i still shed tears when i play through the scene where stuff happens with Locke in the world of ruin yeah when all that stuff was happening i was a genesis guy mm-hmm. and i even had the sega cd <laughs> say that like what a, yeah, what a great you're such a funny guy I did I did no this this is the thing is like because I was like 14 or 15 and I was like uh, my dad was a carpenter and he was doing a lot of roofing work and so I was shoveling shingles for four dollars an hour for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks like I would come home from school and then end up on the job site with a shovel and like shoveling shingles uh, it, it was like six weeks of back-breaking you know, labor. Backbreaking labor, and I finally saved up and I got the Sega CD, and it was such a bummer. Yeah, <laughs> just it felt even worse knowing how much work you'd put in. Right. <laughs> Although Sonic CD, <laughs> Sonic CD was fantastic. Oh gosh. Uh, and Jurassic Park CD was fantastic yeah. as well. Uh-huh. So when did you find your way? In the PS1 era, mm-hmm. I was out looking for a new game to buy. And they had this massive display of Final Fantasy VII. Mm -hmm. And the cover art drew me in. This big display drew me in. It had all of this stuff like, you know, this this is a revolutionary game. You know, you're not to be missed. All this, this, like, hype. And it was three discs. And I was like, what? Not one disc, but three? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my gosh. And so I picked it up and i remember going home and putting it in and playing through a little bit of the beginning and just yep. being like what is it? like i i didn't have the words to explain what i was yeah. playing and i just you know i was like this is so interesting I was really sucked in. And mm-hmm. like once the story really started kicking mm-hmm. in, it was... It kicks butt right out the gate, I think. But what's important to note is that up until this point, uh, Final Fantasy had been exclusively on Nintendo. And Final Fantasy VII was going to be on a Nintendo system yeah. at one point. They also did a Final Fantasy tech demo for the N64 featuring 3D versions of Final Fantasy VI characters mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to show off what Final Fantasy might look like. So what like. happens there? I mean... The the whole Nintendo Sony debacle kind of they had a falling out yeah to say the they least. had a, and so they did their own thing and they got Square to come with them I they think probably Square a lot or of Square people, approached them I can't say for sure but mm-hmm. I suspect there were a lot of companies that didn't like working with Nintendo because mm-hmm. every time I read something about Nintendo in the eighties and nineties I think. <laughs> It must have been really unpleasant to have to deal with them. So I don't think Sony had that hard a time convincing people to jump ship. Because they felt like, oh, thank God we don't have to live up to Nintendo's really weird censorship requirements. Mm -hmm. and Yakuza motherfuckers. (laughs) And plus, I'm given to understand that the ideas they had for Final Fantasy VII, like, it wasn't working Mm -hmm. for the the cartridge. Like, they had... Well, the original Final Fantasy the seven idea was actually uh, primarily Surya Saga and her husband were working on that. 
and Square rejected that idea. They said it was too dark. And so that became Xeno Years, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. was also released on the PlayStation. Sure. They really had big goals for Final Fantasy VII. They poured far more money into it than they would poured into any Final Fantasy game. Mm-hmm. At the time, like, its graphics were state of the art. I remember when people came over, I would make them watch the opening movie of Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. Because at that time, it was it was that impressive that people would have their minds blown yeah. <laughs> seeing that. And they spent a fortune on marketing. They mm-hmm. had a partnership with Pepsi. They had TV spots all over the place. They had ads in Rolling Stone and Playboy and details in magazines like that. Yeah. So they, except for, you know, that girl who worked on the yearbook with Josh, like, <laughs> there was nobody that couldn't know about Final Fantasy. So what was it about Seven that it sort of becomes, well, I guess you could say, like a AAA game? Yeah. In comparison to everything and, that and that was before. really a time before when triple games were really starting to be a thing because mm-hmm. the thing is back in the 16-bit era or the 8-bit era pouring more money into games didn't show as much as it could right once uh, things had moved to Polygon so you could really see like look how great this game looks well, and, look and how impressive audio quality, it is I think also also I feel like it was right game right time uh-huh because like so here's Sony, who after, you know, this problem with Nintendo and they had all those issues, went, fuck it, we're going to make our own console. Uh, and so, like, Sony had been in the electronics games al- game already. Mm-hmm. They had to know that they were going to have to distinguish themselves from Nintendo and from Sega. Yeah. Uh, and so here's... Final Fantasy VII, which Square had poured so much money into, yeah. like the first Final Fantasy game not being published on Nintendo. Yep. So in the gaming community, I, I remember like gaming magazines and stuff having a thing about Nintendo and Square not doing stuff. Let me ask you, Josh, because you actually have an interesting perspective that for me is different. You know, growing up, my brother loved Final Fantasy which is how I was exposed to them. So whatever came out next in that series, as I'm sure it is with Rev and possibly Mandy, whatever's next, you're going to get it regardless. But you're a Genesis guy. Do you remember back to a time even caring about or hearing about Final Fantasy before Seven hits? I mean, was it something you're always like, gosh, that series sounds great? Final Fantasy Seven was really my introduction to Final Fantasy everything. And yeah. I, I was reading playstation magazine back then and i remember so many people kept saying the music in final fantasy 7 is just not up to par and that was like the biggest complaint i was hearing about it Mm -hmm. and i never understood that until i finally went back and listened to some music from final fantasy 3 slash 6 the dancing mad is the best indisputably in my opinion Mm. (laughs) the best video game (laughs) composition of all time there is not a single piece of music in final fantasy 6 that is not fucking fantastic in terms of just composition and in terms of narrative use Mm -hmm. like when they played the music in the game and what like just fantastic through and through Mm -hmm. see i felt that way about final fantasy 7 and i think you know not having played six like i was just like oh my gosh you know, like the Eris theme. I'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. Final Fantasy VII also had the first piece of music, technically, to include vocalizations. You can make an argument that they did it in Final Fantasy VI because there was a song with yeah. words, yeah, but you is. know, it was <laughs> wah, 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 wah. So. But, but do you think that's just more of a reflection of the themes of six versus seven? I do think the music in seven was good. I feel that there are not as many memorable pieces in mm-hmm. seven, so like, I'm not going to disagree with someone who says, well, you know, 7 is not as good as 6 was. Mm -hmm. That's probably true, but you know, I agree with Josh. Eris's theme, fucking beautiful. Like they they used it in beautiful ways. Mm-hmm. The the Cosmo Canyon theme, I just love to death. I could listen to that all day. But like, there's only a few things songs like that in Seven. Mm-hmm. Whereas Six, I remember all of the songs. Mm-hmm. I can still play some of the songs from Final Fantasy Six on my ocarina, even though I haven't practiced in over a year yeah. because I really wanted to learn those songs because they had that big of an impact on me. 
I will say what really fucking blew my mind with Seven were those gosh darn cutscenes. Just watching um, that huge gunfire and, and, and those fucking gigantic beasts, and I was just unready for it. No, Square's cutscenes were really perfectly used in, in that era, and when you look at all of the PlayStation era games and think back to any of the cutscenes, they all have this really iconic imagery, yeah. like the little Final Fantasy nine still of Vivi lying on the stone in the rain, or mm-hmm. Sephiroth mm-hmm. walking into the flames. So even even with Final Fantasy VIII, which I really didn't Final enjoy. Final Fantasy VIII has the best video game opening of all time. It, it really does. Except Except for maybe Xeno Gears. Like one of the things about Seven that really interested me too was I wasn't really used to the idea. I mean, obviously I was playing some Japanese games with the Genesis, but you know, a lot of what I was playing was like platformers or brawlers or stuff like that. And so I hadn't really experienced this like tonal the tonal shifts that Japanese games do so well. Mm-hmm. When you've got, you know, the whole scene where they're in the Shinra labs and there's blood everywhere and you're following <laughs> yeah. the blood trails and like, you know, it's like so dark and you're just not sure what's gonna happen. And then you've got like the Turks talking about which <laughs> member of your party they have a crush on. Right, right. right. It was like, <laughs> like I lo- squat competition. Yeah, it oh was like God. I love that. <laughs> like I was, I was, I was like, you know, that was the first time I had experienced anything like that, and I was, you know, was so fascinated by it. Yep, seven was when they created a stable of characters that were larger than the game itself, and it's sort of gone on to have you know movies and and things like that, sort of based on them, but. They did have a lot of media in Japan that was never released to. Sure. They've been releasing Final Fantasy books in Japan since the first game. Um, radio dramas are not a thing here anymore, but they're still a huge thing in Japan. So most Final Fantasy games had radio dramas. Final Fantasy anime tended to not be successful for a really long mm-hmm. time. Uh, think- because it, most of it was bad, to be yeah, fair. I, I remember that I've seen two different Final Fantasy animes None of which had anything to do with any of the games, and that always threw me off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's Legend of the Crystals, and well, Final Fantasy Unlimited is like a million times better than Legend of the Crystals, for the record. But yeah, uh, Legend which of the one Crystals. Was which? Legend of the Crystals was the one that came out in the 90s. Was it the one with the kid with the big sword and the fat guy? I mean... <laughs> was it was it like two episodes? It was four episodes, but yeah. Okay, that's the one I'm thinking of. I think what I meant to say about Seven and these characters, uh, perhaps in the sort of mainstream generic zeitgeist, you're more than likely going to see Cloud with that big fucking sword um, on a t-shirt or something than you would perhaps Locke It's It's really more or... iconic imagery, exactly. I would say say uh-huh. than I can't kind of writing. It's about it. the imagery and yeah. Mm-hmm. Feel More like prevalent. somebody who has never played a Japanese video game would be say like describe a Japanese character and they would probably describe Claude Strife. After that I didn't play eight, nine, anything after that. I've played every single Final Fantasy and most of the spin offs. The there is sort of an evolution going forward where they start playing with the battle systems, right? The magic uh Basing it more in like a current contemporary sort of. Well, Final, Final Fantasy VI is, I would say, when they moved away from pure fantasy. Mm-hmm. Final Fantasy VI is more steampunk. Yeah. And Final yeah, Fantasy yeah, yeah. VII yeah. and VIII are more pure sci fi. And then Final Fantasy IX is a return that's to the one fantasy. The, they still the water have soccer, right? That's the water soccer, isn't that one? That's 10. That's 10. Okay. Um, Blitz ball. <laughs> I, you were confusing me because I thought you were saying water socket. And I'm like, oh. what's a water socket? Is that a spell that I don't remember? Have we done this before? This seems. <laughs> Even though it's 10 was released on the PlayStation 2. I would lump 10 into that era of Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. For the record, Square does too. <laughs> they call it the golden age of Final okay. Fantasy. Because 11, yeah. is that is that what is 11? 11, 11 was, was an MMO. MMO. That's right. I, I, I played it. I liked it a lot, actually. But And 11 is Square's most profitable game oh, yeah. of all time. Oh, well, good for them. But isn't that then this Realm Reborn? Realm is Reborn that... is, is the second version of Final Fantasy XIV. 14. 14, okay. Which is also an MMO. Because 13, no, okay, I don't, okay, so MMO <laughs> is, 11 is an MMO, yes. and then there's 12, which I don't know anything about. Uh, 12 is set in the same world that the Final Fantasy Tactics games are, Ivalis. Okay. And it is a very good game, but a very, very different sort of game. It has sort of an MMO-inspired gameplay and combat okay. in a lot of ways. Uh, they change directions in the story a lot, and mm-hmm. so there's not really a true lead character. And that's fine. I like ensemble games, but mm-hmm. it does feel like it suffers for that a little bit. But it's a good 
game. I like it a lot, but uh, it feels not so much like a Final Fantasy game. Mm -hmm. As I often put it, Final Fantasy X, which was a good game by itself. Mm -hmm. I liked it. I don't like Final Fantasy X. I I liked it well enough, uh, but... Tin was about the time when the series started to crawl up its own ass. Mm -hmm. I can't speak to what was happening internally. I don't know how sales went. Mm -hmm. Just how it feels to me, having played, you know, from the Super Nintendo era Mm -hmm. through. It feels like Tin was where they started to go, oh no, our original formula isn't working. We have to do new stuff. And we have to make these deep, complex plots. And we have to, no, you have Mm -hmm. to make Final Fantasy. Well, because all along they've had tactics. There were Game Boy Final Fantasies right. and all that shit. Well, most you know? of the Game Boy Final Fantasies weren't actually Final Fantasies. Yeah, right. they, were, they were games that got Final Fantasy put in their title and okay. they were released in okay. the West. Most of them were saga games. Then, you you know, somewhere in there, the, the Dirge of Cerebus comes out. It's a bad game. You know, it, it it's was action not a good game. <laughs> focused. I don't know. 10, whatever. 11 says MMO. 12's out there. I seem to recall shit where it's like one game versus another one or something. 13 comes out. Lightning. What? I mean, what? What is going on? It feels like at some point Square decided nobody wanted Final Fantasy anymore and they kept trying to change up the formula. Well, it kind of seems like... You have to remember that while Final Fantasy X was in development was also when Square was making Final Fantasy Spirits Within, which was the Final Fantasy movie. With Steve Buscemi. It was, it, it was not necessarily very good. I think it visually aged very well. I own it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th- I still think it looks great. Mm-hmm. There are parts that look a little iffy, but... But for the time, it was remarkable. It was sort of the same. It it was the sort of the same strategy that they took with Final Fantasy VII, and that they just poured a ton of money in it into it, put a ton of money into marketing. Mm -hmm. Like they had, you know, their lead Aki in the cover of all these magazines. Mm -hmm. But the movie only did okay, Mm -hmm. which meant it was a huge bomb because they spent an enormous amount of money on it. Oh yeah, Alec Baldwin. He ain't cheap. Square had had their flush of cash that they had earned in the PlayStation or Final Fantasy it was gone. And uh, Edix had been Shit. trying to find a company to partner with this sometime. They've been in talks with both Namco and Square. Mm-hmm. And what did Enix done up to this point? Dragon Quest. Okay. I mean, other things too, but, but that was what they were known for, was sure. Dragon and Quest. Enix and Triace did the Star Ocean series, right? <laughs> no, Enix just published Star Ocean. They weren't involved in development. Okay. okay. But uh, Enix had been shopping around for a company to partner with for some time, and they'd talked to Square before, mm-hmm. and they hadn't been seriously moving forward with it. And at that point, Square was in a financial Mess, yeah. and so they needed to do something. And Enix was actually at that point <laughs> less confident about partnering with Square because they'd lost all that money. So it would be a merger, before. but not an acquisition. A merger, yeah. Okay. So they really needed to prove themselves again to get money back again because they had blown through all their money. So that was their primary focus, really, was to regain their flush of cash. And I think there was a big loss of confidence because there'd never been a major Final Fantasy failure. Mm-hmm. Nothing on that scale, at mm-hmm. least, at that time. Mm-hmm. The mainline games had all been well received. Mm-hmm. I and, know people uh, who love the tactics games. I mean, oh, I mean, a lot of people will argue that Final Fantasy Tactics is the best Final Fantasy of all time. Mm. A lot of people will argue a lot of things. But that it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but uh, there was a, a lack of faith. I think it was really disheartening mm-hmm. for a lot of people who worked at Square. So that's definitely what I would blame more than anything else. So for the tone when did this merger occur? What game then was next on the horizon? Technically, Final Fantasy. Fantasy Crystal Chronicles was the first uh, Final Fantasy game Square Enix released, but Final Fantasy X-2 was the first one they released in North America. And is that the first like direct sequel to a Final Fantasy game? Yes. Chronologically, it's not because Final Fantasy IV got a direct sequel, but X-2 was released before Final it Fantasy IV the after years was. Th- which was a big deal at the time, because it's like, no, th- that's the Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. And like, which, you know, it was always just a name, but mm-hmm. people had gotten it into their head that like oh this is the last epic uh you know quest of that of each world or whatever bullshit they had come up with yeah. to explain why it was final fantasy other than because they wanted an f word well <laughs> and a lot of themes would carry over throughout the series you know those jacobo birds jacobos, jacobos, right. jacobos and there's always a guy named sid yeah there's um, always a sid do these things i mean is it the same world ever and it, no i mean for... yes yes because uh they're final fantasy seven games uh set in the same world they're final fantasy 13 games set in the <laughs> right, same world but and I mean, there's ivalis like... and which is the tactics world which in okay. final fantasy 12 
So there are instances where multiple games are set in the same world. Mm -hmm. But but I don't think any mainline game Mm -hmm. is set in the same world as previous mainline games. Tin 2 wasn't a great game. No, yes it was. It's the best gameplay in any Final Fantasy by far. None of them can even touch in it. See, I agree with that, but people keep telling me that I'm wrong. No, no. So that's why I qualify that. (laughs) It's it's probably the the most fast-paced strategic turn-based gameplay ever created. And I think some people are reluctant to it because the strategy is based on costume usage. Which is why I love it. You have to you have to figure out how to change costumes in the appropriate order to get these massive tactical benefits while also every costume changes your character's skill sets and abilities. And the battles are extremely fast paced. So you have to on the fly think of these ways to use all these different skills in the right order to get this massive benefit. It's like a it's, Weird Al Yankovic concert. It's and incredibly hard <laughs> to do some of this stuff well. That's Not for me because I am fortunately <laughs> overleveled because I like the battle system yeah. too and, much. But. And they have transformation sequences when they, you know, change costumes. So it's it's everything I yeah. love. But every time I talk about how much I love it, people tell me I'm wrong and it's a terrible game. So, yeah. okay, whatever. Okay, so I don't know what Lightning or any of that shit is, but 14 comes out. Well, 11 was the first MMO. Right. And that was well. the first time. Oh, it did very. It's it's to date. Still being but, played. Yeah, it, it, it's to date Square Enix's most profitable game by a lar- very large margin. Mm-hmm. So, to, what but, was the point of 14 then? I mean. Well, because they wanted to release a new MMO because it was very old. Mm-hmm. I mean, 11 was pre WoW. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, right, well, that, that, that's a good way to quantify that. So, but I mean, so what is 14? It wasn't, I mean, it's bad. Was it bad? The original version was so bad that they shut it down and put out a new version oh, and, well, and, and gave a bunch of free stuff to the people who had paid for it as an apology. And Square Enix uh-huh. publicly said it was an embarrassment. Okay, so 14 is bad. They shut it down. They come out. Realm Reborn is great. Later. I love it. Years later, is it? No, mean? no, it was immediately. immediately. They were they they were working on how to fix it continuously. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, so, it was like three years between. Yeah, but I mean, from the moment they shut it down to when Realm Reborn was uh-huh. released, it was immediate. I'm saying is that they oh, shut it down shut as server. the new game was sure. released. It's just nobody yeah. was playing it, so nobody knows. Well, because they wanted people playing the the version of the game that uh-huh. wasn't garbage. Though I'm sure some people liked even the bad version because people always will. But uh, of course, I mean it's a final. In fact, I, I do know somebody who was a hardcore defender of that game <laughs> in the early days. Well, but good uh, on them. I think Final Fantasy XI was a good game. It was a pre-WoW MMO, which meant it had a lot of really annoying trades mm-hmm. that WoW sort of helped Addresses. streamline mm-hmm. out of MMOs. Yeah. But uh, no, it had the really interesting concept of having uh, players from around the world all on the same server. So yeah, you could yeah, play yeah. with Japanese players and they had built in sort of translation software. It wasn't really complex. It was common phrases that you'd need to use. You could quickly select them and then it would translate it mm-hmm. to them for you. So you could communicate and party up with, uh, which I usually did. I primarily, I worked overnights then, so I primarily played with Japanese yeah. players and it was really fun. That I was, liked it a lot. That was cross-platform? Yeah. Yeah, it was on PS2 and PC, and uh-huh. that was also shared servers. Right. I played it on PS2. Yeah. You yeah, just had to buy a hard drive for the PS2. as well. PS4, PS3, and PC. Now, but, uh, for the new one? For 14. 14, Realm Reborn. Yeah. Cool. Final Fantasy XI was successful for Square Enix, and I don't mean to imply otherwise, but I think it was damaging for the Final Fantasy brand. Hmm. Not because it was a bad game, but because it was a numbered game. Sure. And right. so it sort of changed the way that people perceived numbered Final Fantasy releases. And but- Final Fantasy X, I don't really like it, but mm-hmm. it did really well. And there are lots of people who love it. Mm-hmm. And so instead of capitalizing on that, they spent all their time on an MMO. And then when 12 was released, it didn't get the kind of attention that a Final Fantasy game might have gotten if they'd released. That is kind of well, bizarre. And, you know, the 10, the, like they changed things up a little bit with each game. Yep. You know, uh, 7 had the Materia system, which was kind of a refinement of the Slots Magicite from the, 6. Yep. Uh, then then 8, and they eight did the Junction, draw magic. Which, oh my gosh. which was just the worst, in well, my you, opinion. You, 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 probably, you could do it very efficiently in bulk draw. You could bulk draw, and then you hardly ever had to draw, and you could primarily use uh, Junctioning as a stat boosting system. I remember, I remember spending hours just grinding Oh no, draws. you were doing it wrong. 
Whoa. Uh, you, and were, then, you were bad at Final Fantasy VIII. You know, and then, <laughs> and then with nine, they went back to some of their previous uh, ideas with, uh-huh. you know, each uh, equip item teaching you certain abilities. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, each character having like a character class with certain abilities. Uh, and then, you know, with 10, they did the sphere grid, which people keep telling me was weird and complicated. And I'm like, no, it's, it wasn't. it's not. It's just, uh, it's love. You just pick the next thing. Yeah. Um, I, I seem to remember there was some issue with the trailer for 13 and then the actuality of the game. There was some. Yeah, well, they, they, sh- they did not show gameplay footage. Mm hmm. Right away, and there was a really because Final Fantasy thirteen had a very very long development time, and yes. so there was a very long period of time where people had some footage and screenshots, but had no idea how the game would actually play. Mm-hmm. And there are certain people for whom controlling each individual character is very important, which you can technically do for the record in both Final Fantasy twelve and Final Fantasy thirteen. Mm-hmm. But uh, going through the turns and controlling everybody is very important, and yeah. not switching characters. Uh, mid battle, which mm-hmm. is more fun. But <laughs> <laughs> so on the horizon now we have uh, Final Fantasy fifteen, which that initially was a different one, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, it, was, so it was Final Fantasy versus thirteen. Which what does that mean? I don't know what that's. Well, when they to originally were developing Final Fantasy thirteen, they were going to do a trilogy, and they did a trilogy, but it was a, like originally it was going to be Final Fantasy thirteen, Final Fantasy thirteen versus, and Final Fantasy thirteen Agito. Versus kept disappearing, mm-hmm. and Ajito ended up coming out as Type Zero. Um, Final Fantasy Type Zero is what it's called. Yeah, or? Type Zero. Yeah. Then I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a handheld game, and it definitely it feels like a handheld game. I've like the remastered version. It's yeah, the remastered version is available on Steam right now, and it feels like it definitely feels like it should be a handheld game. I mean, I had fun with it, mm-hmm. but Versus disappeared for a while. So the third game came out before the second game. It wasn't necessarily like a chronological trilogy. Yeah, the, oh, the yes. idea was it was called uh, Fab- Fabula Nova Crystallis, which translates to a new tale of the crystal in Latin. Sort of. It's kind of rough Latin. But uh, the idea was to do a bunch of games in this singular universe. And I do think that part of the idea was like, oh, we can reuse a bunch of assets and save money. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, that, that was their big plan. And so they did reuse a bunch of assets and save a bunch of money mm-hmm. and come up with a bunch of games in that universe and expand on that mythology. But I think part of the thing with Versus is that it was actually looked really good. Yeah, with that first trailer, like I still go back and rewatch that trailer and it's mm-hmm. like, holy shit, this game looks so good. Yeah. It, it did look amazing, the yeah. trailer. Final Fantasy 13 it was is successful. Mm-hmm. It's done well, mm-hmm. but it wasn't it wasn't well received mm-hmm. in the US and I think they saw that this game in development looked really good and people were responding really positively to it and they didn't even have time necessarily to start developing final fantasy 15 from scratch well they had done some concept work which i've seen and looked completely different but i mean it was a lot of a lot of sea-based stuff it was like when you when you look at the stuff that they were doing with versus it was so exciting because it was like, this is what I've been missing from Final Fantasy. Like, this looks like a return to, you know, Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. And, and I had think Kingdom Hearts gameplay, which is great because I hate Kingdom Hearts, but the gameplay is wonderful. I, th- I think a light bulb went off somewhere in over some executive's head and is like, oh, wait, I think I get what people want. They probably had to start from scratch and start developing toward that. Mm-hmm. Final Fantasy Versus was announced in 2006, and it's finally supposed to come out in 2016. So, yeah. you know, 10 years later, yeah. this game is finally coming out. They've put out a couple demos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played the first one. One just came out recently. Yeah, yeah. I have it downloaded, but I haven't played it yet. Watching too many nature documentaries. <laughs> the Rev was there. We all, yeah. the Rev, Mandy and I sat and played through mm-hmm. you're that, pushing cars that are out of gas yeah your car is like breaks down or something and yeah i wasn't impressed like i saw what they were trying to do it's not what i want out of a final fantasy game even though i really do like the aesthetic of dudes with big ass swords fighting dinosaurs looks like that it looks great i i like the i like a lot of the ideas but it's 
Uh, I don't want a uh, open world action RPG out of my Final Fantasy. I, I want Final Fantasy. That's mm-hmm. that's why I bought Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. And I I think I mean so far I everything I've seen looks fantastic. Then we're looking at the remake of Final Fantasy VII, everybody's favorite game, Granny's favorite fucking game. They're remaking it. Final Fantasy VII. They're adding, (laughs) from what I can tell, I mean, they're going for this action-orientated combat approach, which to me, I don't mind. I mean, to me, maybe because I I really liked Secret of Mana, but it just sort of seems like all you're really doing is moving your character around, actively dodging the attacks that you would otherwise be standing still for, hoping that the dice roll allows them to miss hitting you. And instead of pressing X and selecting fight, you're just pressing X and he's swinging a sword in real time, you know. Um, well, movement placement becomes important once you switch to action combat. I like it. I like movement placement I like being it. important. I don't know if I'm I'm not actually excited for the Final Fantasy VII remake. Really? Um, nah, I could really uh, care less. I'm but, excited. You know, I don't even know if I'll ever play it, but uh, that's just because I don't, um, I just don't play those types of games anymore. I'd much rather play Mass Effect. <laughs> I'm joking. Mass Effect. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm excited actually that it's epi- episodic because uh-huh. I really kind of miss that PlayStation era type of game where the disc ending felt like wrapping up one point in the story yeah. and then like the next disc is the continuation of that. And it didn't always happen that way, but I like, I really loved that feeling. Yeah. Like this is like the to be continued point if you were watching it on TV mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, what's going to happen next time? And it felt good. It almost felt like you beat the game three or four times, depending on how many discs the game had. Yeah. And so if they can, they can pull that off. That would be really cool. And and this isn't necessarily a popular opinion, but I don't like Final Fantasy VII that much after the end of Disc 1. I think Disc 1 is perfect, and I think the game kind of feels sloppy after mm. Disc 1 to mm. me, not to the world at large. And uh, so I'd really like to see them refine the later parts of the story and flesh it out more, mm. and it seems like they'll have the time to do that. So that would be really fun for me. I think, although I've grown used to hearing voice added to these characters later on in Advent, children and such it'll be kind of maybe a little jarring at first to hear them speaking in this remake some some of that dialogue is a little hokey but i like it anyway yeah i don't know i mean we'll see how it goes i guess right i mean but that is pretty much where i like i want to be annoyed by stuff i hear but <laughs> like i i don't know i'm not invested enough i guess because yeah. like i hear the like everything that they say oh we're gonna try this i'm going Okay, I can see why you would try that. I don't understand why you think people who want Final Fantasy VII want all these changes, but maybe they do. Mm-hmm. You know, not everyone has the same tastes I do. Mm-hmm. And I'm totally in agreement with Mandy that there's a lot of stuff in the later half of the game. I don't know that I'd say disc one is the cutoff, but there's a lot of stuff uh, in the later parts of Final Fantasy VII that aren't very well fleshed out, that yeah. aren't very well uh, implemented. So, you know, like, yeah. maybe they'll do it well. I don't know. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not thrilled about the action RPG combat, but, you know, that's what we're doing now. So that's what yeah. we're doing. You know, and uh, obviously they're probably going to change a decent amount of the game, I would assume. Well, and see, and that's the thing. Like, how much are you going to change? They guys? confirmed a lot of stuff is staying in. They I'm confirmed, sure, yeah. like, Cloud's whole thing where he has to disguise himself and do the squat competition will still be in the game. Yeah, that's like a fan. Which is the most important you part to me. You can't no squat competition, that. no buy. Yeah, you can't not do that. See, I the reason I liked that whole bit was because it was obviously played for humor, but it wasn't like it wasn't ha ha dudes in a dress that's funny. Mm-hmm. The whole situation was ridiculous that he was having to well, do these things. People were really pretty cool about it. They're like, "Oh, hey, yeah, right. we're in a dress. Well, right, for you, you know." And like, they weren't making fun of him. Right, exactly. They, like they, they were just like, "Oh, so that's what you're doing, huh?" Right. They they weren't making him the butt of the joke for it. And then you know, if he got chose, you know, it was just you know, you're just another chick. Oh, you're not. And again, like, so I, that's why that part worked really well for me too because yeah. it wasn't insulting about it. That was the the original character's design for lightning. <laughs> <laughs> you hang your head in shame. No, someone someone took <laughs> someone took um Cloud's face and overlaid it over Lightning's face and like it's like the same design. <laughs> 
That's, oh, funny. that's kind of amusing considering certain things about lightning. Her creator has said that he created her to be his ideal woman, and like he has like a body pillow of lightning. <laughs> wow. People joke about her being his waifu, so maybe mm. he was in love with Cloud and felt uncomfortable about that. He's like, What if I made attractive woman Cloud and didn't give her a personality? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> What a babe that would be. It was on cloud nine with that one. Man, you know, only thing I hope is that uh, at the point where you're running up all those goddamn stairs that somebody just finds a convenient elevator. Um, well, you didn't have to go up I the play, stairs. I played the game on PC for mm-hmm. the first time, and the PC version had so many frame rate issues, and oh my god, yeah. that opening section was like a nightmare on the PC, yeah, because I... you'd suddenly, the game would be like running at like one frame per second, and oh, you'd be trying yeah. to get out before the time ran out. Oh, it was the worst. <laughs> So, what does the future hold for this geriatric gaming franchise? Yeah, it's hard to say. I think they've tried to reinvigorate it throughout the years to varying degrees of, of success and uh, have done some things that maybe have put off lifetime fans or puzzled people. Or you know, maybe this new game will bring in a whole new um, generation of gamers who like their hair spiked and uh i don't know but the sword's uh, gigantic the sword's <laughs> gigantic but who doesn't like a gigantic sword I mean, it really speaks towards what you have in your trousers um <laughs> if you've played a final fantasy game much as i have and i'm sure the rest of us have growing up there are definitely fond memories and it's a shining um example of how to do a game right when it's done really right you know change the landscape terraformed the video game landscape's body with proverbial battery acid. <laughs> and it'll be exciting to see where it goes, how long it'll go. Where is where is the franchise heading? I guess we'll have to Final Fantasy. And with that, Half Glass Gaming out. <laughs> <laughs> around prison Joe because <laughs> he might murder you and go back to prison. <laughs>